Metal Jesus here, and I am back again with Dave. How's it going, dude? I'm good. Thank you very much. I managed to get a rare five minutes to play games, and I have to talk about them before the time runs out. <laughs> I know, and I'm so glad you're here because uh, last time we shot a video, we were over at your house, and you showed me your game room, and it was, I mean, no joke, it was like the, the, the doors of Valhalla opened, and I was, oh, uh, no, no. <laughs> I was blown away because you've got games that I haven't seen in a long time. You focus primarily on flight sims. Yep, that's right. And it was such a cool genre back in the day. It, it's a genre that I tipped my toe in a little bit and used to love, and we're gonna talk about that. Yeah. But today we're gonna cover a little bit of the, your collection. Yeah, so uh, I think what we can do is, uh, I'm gonna talk about you know what are the best platforms to play mm -hmm. these on, how to get some of these things to run today, because you can't just buy an old PC and run it the way right. you buy an old console, it's kind of painful. Uh, and I'll walk you through some of my favorites and uh, see if we can get some other people interested in uh, this very cool area, actually. Yeah, it's a genre and of, of games that really just dominated for a, you know, a decade or two, yeah, and people right. have kind of forgot about it. So we're mm. going to cover it today. It's going to be awesome. Yep, it is. All right, let's take a look. All right, dude, so first I have to ask, why flight sims? What, what, what drew you to them? Okay, so it's kind of the coming together of a couple things. So when I was growing up, uh, my dad and my uncle would build uh, radio control model planes, right? So okay. there was a bunch of plane stuff lying around the house, mm -hmm. and um, they kind of got me into building those little model planes you know, with the glue and you dribble glue and paint all over oh, the place. Yeah. And so I kind of got me interested in planes, and then, you know, we had a Commodore 64 around the house, and next thing you know, hey, there's a game here. It's <laughs> flying game, F-15 Strike Eagle. F-15 Strike Eagle, um, I remember that, yeah. And, you know, so it, and it wasn't so much the game that got mm. me into it, it was the manual. Like you open up the pack, you had this yeah, beautiful that, manual. It explained the physics of flight and it showed you maps of yes. everything and all the bombs and the planes. And you know, if you're like eight years old, that just sucks you right in. <laughs> and then once you start playing these games, it really it is super intriguing because mm. they are first person perspective, which at the time yeah. was really rare, right? Like yeah, Commodore 64 first person point. games. Yeah. So they were yeah, really yeah. compelling. Especially yeah. back then, it's like usually in most games, you're like a little figure on the screen, jumping right. around, whatever. But yeah, yeah you're right. I, mean, I was the captain, right? Or I yeah. was the pilot. That's was, right, yeah. Huh. And, uh, you know, so they were just so cool because it was first person. They were open world. You could go do whatever you wanted. I mean, they mm. told you you got a mission to do, but you could go do other stuff you wanted, right? Yeah. Which again was very rare for the time. Yeah. Um, and so that just ability to just go do whatever you want and have this freedom, mm -hmm. that was just really sucks you right in. Yeah. For, for me, and it's funny you mentioned the Commodore 64, is that one of the first games I was uh, obsessed about on my Commodore was the original gunship. Yeah. And I'm not really like, you know, I, I didn't have a father who, who was like in the military like that or anything. Yeah. Um, but kind of like what you said though, I got sucked into it. Well, mm -hmm. one, you were going up in ranks, right? So there was like this RPG element to That's it. That's right, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and then also, too, there was this big learning curve with just doing it correctly. And yeah. I really felt like, hey, I could, you know, when I was younger, I was like, I can go out and I can fly my own you know, Apache, right? Yeah. yeah <laughs> Probably not, uh, but you know what I mean? Yeah, but but, sure. yeah. but that was something that you did not typically get on a console. The That's consoles right, yeah. were just not powerful enough to really get that deep into, into yeah. you know, a simulator. Yeah, and I think the consoles actually had... Uh, another thing going against them in the flight sim, and that is like the controllers had very few buttons, right? Ah, uh, good point. So one of the things that was cool about flight sims yes. and still is like, there's so much stuff to do. You've got to manage the flaps and the yep. engine yep. and the weapon yep. systems, yep. and so it requires a lot of buttons. So every key on a keyboard on a good flight sim is just mapped to something. And to that point, a lot of these games came with keyboard overlays. Yeah, because it was so complicated, you yeah. didn't remember, right? <laughs> yeah. so you had to have a thing to show you what yeah. to push. Yeah. Although that reminds me, just as a side note, uh, I remember the original Tie Fighter, which was a you know. Yeah. Tie Fighter Simulator came with a keyboard overlay. I was like, "Oh, yeah. right on! This is a serious flight sim here." Right. <laughs> well, actually, the Tie Fighter game was made by Lawrence Holland, who's one of the kind of you know grand old men of really? flight sim world. Yeah. Well, so that he makes did sense. Uh, Secret Weapons of the Luftwaffe and oh. you know their finest hour. So you know him, huh. Damon Sly, Brent Iverson, and Sid Meier. Those are like you know the holy quadrilogy of uh, interesting. Of flight sims, so, yeah. Interesting. So okay, so so you had big, massive manuals that were fun to read back in the day. Oh, I know. So cool. So uh, cool. You also had um, you know keyboard overlays. Were there anything else that kind of came with these things? So um, the thing which didn't come with them but really made it central was just a whole cool range of hardware controllers, right? Oh, so right, right. you could buy joysticks for the Commodore sixty four, obviously, but right. QuickShot produced a line of joysticks that looked like 
the joystick on a plane and like you had to have that thing uh, and then as we move on you know like thrustmaster produced sticks with 40 buttons and i mean yeah. that's just all in itself is a really cool area to just get into collecting and actually. you have control flight controllers <laughs> all over your home and I, yeah. some of them i haven't seen in a long time uh the gravis controllers you yep. uh the force feedbacks from microsoft yep remember those with the throttle and that's right and, 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 and <laughs> but at his desk you have set up like like almost like yeah. you're in a real cockpit I mean, so yeah that's uh, so as time you get now to the yeah. stuff being produced now thrustmaster produces an amazing range of controllers which are actual made from the plans of real aircraft controllers so right. the one i have in my desk now is the thrustmaster warthog hmm. which is actually copied off the a10 control panel so oh. you feel pretty good when you're flying that thing <laughs> that is pretty sweet does yeah. it have an eject button you know no, no i think that's the wheels on my uh, desk i just <laughs> kick the wall and like oh! Uh, that is so funny, <laughs> but but um, but I, I guess getting back to like you know the uh, the old school PC games here though they were almost like collectors editions really that, yeah. you know today's collectors editions right. yeah. but it was very standard they're very heavy <laughs> you know they come with yeah. uh, catalogs and all sorts of really cool yeah. stuff and it actually it almost becomes like an arms race of how much stuff you put in your manual so yeah. you know when Micropros were kind of the first people to to do this stuff. Um, and they would put in, you know, they would show you, well, this is the plane, this is how you fly, etc. And then later, mm -hmm. when Sierra started working with Dynamics to produce, the Dynamics right. manuals were amazing. Yeah. So you get like, you know, Aces of Europe, and the manual brings a whole history of World War Two in know. the manual. I know. So it's just amazing because you know you're playing. It just puts you so deep into that game. You're so connected yeah. to what's going on. It's just great. And so you mentioned Dynamics. Uh, I, when I was at Sierra, that was my job was to support Dynamics games, oh. and it was a complete joy because, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's like I had these manuals at my desk and I would just read them and <laughs> you know uh, just take it all in it was yeah. so much fun and, and those games were a little bit more arcadey but they're also yeah. uh, you know a lot of fun too yeah so. no I mean that's the one of the cool things about the genre is that between the kind of mid 80s and the mid 90s mm -hmm. which is a kind of golden era mm -hmm. of flight sims people produce all kinds of difficulty levels right so it was yeah. like the, uh, the ACE series which dynamic produced yeah. were um, yeah, arcadey, but yeah. still, you know, there was some real physics there. Right. And then all the way through to kind of some of the more advanced stuff like um, Spectrum Holobyte was doing with the Falcon series. Right. There was a lot of button pushing and management there. And then some games would let you set switches in the game and, you know, control the level of difficulty there. Oh, so okay. people think, oh man, it's so complicated. It's right. actually not, right? You can find a flight sim which has got the level of difficulty that works for you. Uh, and then kind of, you know, it's the mm -hmm. gateway drug. You kind of start playing <laughs> yeah. and then next thing you know, it's four in the morning. So, yeah. All right, dude, so let's talk about some of your favorite games. Okay. And you have a pile here on this table, and I recognize several of them. Okay. We're gonna start with this, right? Which is... Yeah, so uh, this is F-117A, Stealth Fighter 2.0, and it's called 2.0 because F-19 was Stealth Fighter 1.0, I guess. Well, this was, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, you probably know for sure, but, uh, at the time, we did not know what this airplane was going to look Correct. like. Correct. So that is a great story. Yes. And so, so this, this this was made before we actually knew what right. the Stealth Fighter was going to be. And so, this was the guess or something, right? Right. So there was supposedly a leak from the Department of Defense that the Stealth Fighter was this, this thing. Yeah. Uh, but it was actually a ruse that the DoD had done to like fool the Soviets. Because this is Cold War times, right? Like yeah, it was like spies right. and the whole thing. <laughs> And so that Sid Meier produced this game, and this is actually the last flight sim that Sid Meier makes, and oh. he feels like this is the pinnacle of his flight sim making ability. Well, when this came out, I love this game. I thought That's it was a so much fun. Game. Yeah. What's interesting about though is that this is a very round version of that. So again, it was yeah. designed to trick, and yeah. it completely did because the the actual Nighthawk is very angular. Yeah, and actually, well, so when you move from this game to this one the cool thing is the transition is really kind of smooth the controls are very similar hmm. they've improved yeah. a bunch of stuff like there's definitely it's a better game um but it's so easy to move from this one into this one and yeah. then this one was released when they knew what the actual stealth fighter looked yeah like, right? I, just, I love that piece of history because yeah. again it's like you know <laughs> that never happens it's so yeah. awesome <laughs> and then here are two games that are close to my heart yeah. we've already mentioned uh uh, Aces over Europe, which is the one you prefer, right? Um, oh, it's so hard. Yeah. Such a hard choice. I, they are also, they're kind of sequels of each other. So first yeah. there was, I think it was A-10 came first. Yeah, yeah. Then it was Red Baron, which yeah. I really like as mm -hmm. well. I do too. Then Pacific and then Europe. Yeah. So 
if you've played Red Baron or A10, like again, it's so easy to pick these up and go. Yeah. Because um, they're by Dynamics. That's the set. Damon Slice Crew, right? They made some yeah. fantastic games. And so, depending on what mood I'm in, if I'm feeling in a you know tropical island mood, then I'll <laughs> blow up people in the Pacific. And yeah. if I'm feeling more foresty, I'll blow up people in Germany. Um, this one has slightly better graphics. They tweaked the, the that, graphics yeah. engine. Mm -hmm. um, but again, they just both really awesome games. Yeah, really the one fun. thing I didn't bring today is they made a, an expansion pack for this, which was 1946. Did we? Uh, which is like, what happens if the Pacific War had lasted one more year, right? Oh, interesting. And so it's like, it's got a that. campaign which is like, what if the US had to invade Japan? And so you've got all these like, you know, what if jet fighter planes and this kind of advanced oh, Japanese design made it very cool. I don't remember cool, that. It's okay, well, I'm gonna run off to eBay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, dude. All right. Very cool. Okay, the next two are uh, from Electronic Arts. Electronic Arts was uh, before they became the thing that we all hate, I guess. Uh, <laughs> right. They were hugely popular, and the thing that made them popular, of course, was they had this Rockstar game developer mm -hmm. idea, right? That they were going to put the developers' names on the box oh, and yeah, right. the whole thing, like right? Records and all that. Yeah, stuff. that's right. So um, one of their top guys was Brent Iverson, who produced a lot of great games. And so LHX is one of the first games. This is actually a helicopter game. And it's is, is, is this a stealth helicopter? Is that so what? yeah, the what idea is? was this was a helicopter. There's also an interesting bit of history. The LHX was a project that was supposed to be built and then you know they based the game on that and then the project got cut okay so, huh. <laughs> uh, this same helicopter also appears in microprose's gunship 2000 so oh, okay yeah Interesting. so this game is very arcadey super easy to get into hmm. it's um, a good cover though yeah it is it's kind of got this weird uh, yeah almost like a record cover right it's mm -hmm. very kind of arty and 80s which mm -hmm. is cool um, so very cool game to get into and then this game this is very close to my heart like a lot of my college days were spent playing this uh brent iverson again um this was this required a pentium 90 to run this was hardcore hardcore, <laughs> hardcore. and the reason why is because it had texture map graphics oh okay. which was the thing right like yeah. all these other games we've looked at it was just flat colored polygons yeah. so that just required crazy amounts of computing power now this looks like a, a jane's uh box here but it's not is it's it? not this is actually the first game in a series that eventually led to some of the james right so okay. this kind of branch of ea got spun off into james okay because uh, a very similar style in, yeah, the, in the cover that's right yeah, yeah. um hmm. so this was actually one they made a whole series of these i think it must have been six or seven games in the end hmm. um if you want to play this game actually the easiest way is there is a james game called fighters anthology which oh. includes all the entire series and that is actually it runs just on if you run like windows 10 or something modern it just runs straight out the box oh, really wow. and it's great value for money. It's got all the manuals, it's got all the planes, very cool. So very fun game. One of the things that made this cool is you, the other guy in the plane, the guy in the back seat, actually speaks to you. So as you're flying, he'll say, well, there's a guy at your six o'clock or whatever. Oh, and they had a cool Easter egg where if you like, produced a lot of like shook the plane around a lot the guy would have start complaining and then he would throw up you just hear him like that was like really cool he just came up. that's awesome um so those were kind of um the arcadey arcadey and i still go back to them i still mm -hmm. go back to them like f19 i will still crank that up every now and then yeah. play uh great like kind of beer and pretzel game right yeah. um you know if you want to start getting hardcore into the games which require you to really understand you know the radars and all that yeah. um there are plenty Holobite. of those too spectrum holobite so um the kind of 800 pound gorilla in the flight sim world was Falcon 3.0. Yeah, I remember when Falcon 3.0 came out. One, it was it was buggy, um, a it's, little. It was the buggiest game in history at the time. That's what people say. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Well, I, I don't know, but I I do know that. I mean, it pushed the hardware. I, I remember yeah. people would cry. It'd be like they go out buy a brand new computer and it might not even run on. That's it. right. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things about Falcon was it was so advanced that it actually had two versions of the game. One of them. That's right. One of them was for the regular 386, and one that's was right. for the 386 with the maths coprocessor. Oh, or the 486. That's so, so funny. Yeah, that's right. Because uh, <laughs> computers back in the day had optional math coprocessors. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And of course, when that. you're doing flight sims, there's a lot of you know maths, yeah. maths trigonometry, and stuff. Yeah. So obviously, having the math coprocessor helped. Huh. So um, this is the gold version. So this includes uh, Falcon 3.0 plus all the add-ons they did, MiG 29 and Hornet. Mm -hmm. um, Epic this, manual. This box weighs about I know. five pounds. <laughs> it is filled with all kinds of awesome box, uh, awesome uh, books. One of the things that's in here is uh, actually they produced a VHS video. Um, <laughs> okay. So this is on CD, but they produced a VHS, which is Pete Bonani, who was a real F-16 pilot, giving you a class on how to do dogfighting. 
Huh. And it is hardcore. They talk about huh. energy management and like the formulas for calculating like your oh, corner dude. velocity. You it love is this, so didn't cool. You? Yeah. <laughs> it's actually, if you look for the art of the kill on YouTube, some people have put, uh, have put those videos on huh. there. It's very cool. Wow. Um, so, actually, one of the things that I love about a Falcon 3 is it had a rabid kind of community. Oh, I, rem I remember. People wrote whole books. Like, here is a giant book about, you know, how to get the most out of. So, so as if the manual that came to the game wasn't enough. <laughs> That's right, yeah. 400 pages not enough. <laughs> Boom. Here's another 200 pages pages yeah and let me tell you that is super fun yeah like you really feel connected to a game it's yeah. like when you play um you know like you play oblivion or skyrim and you want to read all the little in-game books uh, there's a whole lore to it yeah which you want to get into that. it's very cool yeah. now no you didn't mention falcon 4.0 and that, that was the last version of that right falcon 4 was the last one actually falcon 4 is cool because uh one of the things that happened was after uh spectrum holobyte shut down mm -hmm. uh the source code falcon 4 was released to the community. Oh, really? And so people have actually written mo versions using recompile the, the game on modern hardware. Huh. So there is uh, a couple of versions out there. We'll put the links at the bottom. Yeah. Um, so what happens is you download the installer from, uh, it's free, right? And you pop in your original Falcon 4 disc to prove that you own a copy. Huh. And then you can play this game. And it wow. looks beautiful, right? Because oh, really? it's all running modern hardware. It's yeah. all DirectX 10. Huh. And I, I remember correctly, if you buy Falcon 3, in GOG, they actually bundle Falcon 4 with it. Huh. And then you can do that. So that's, that's cool. something worth checking up. If you're into hardcore yeah. games, Falcon 4 is very cool. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've yeah. heard that. Okay. Okay, another one. This one is probably not as well known to uh, American I've heard members of, of the audience. That's Tornado. So the Tornado is a British plane. Oh, well, okay. That's a European plane. It actually, okay. it flies with the, I think, the German Air Force, the Italians, and uh, hmm. the, uh, the cool Royal Air cover, Force. Though. Love that. It is very cool, yeah. So hmm. this is a very in depth game. Uh, what makes this cool is. The uh, Falcon kind of has, um, it kind of tries to cover a lot of ground, whereas this takes a, a small number of areas and really takes them in detail. Okay. One of my favorite things in this game, which no other game I've seen yet does correctly, is when you do laser guided bombing. Most games you kind of just, you know, there's a target, press a button and the bomb goes. Yeah. Here you actually have to manage the camera. You control that camera, you zoom in, you turn on the laser. Oh, you can kind of see the bombs and guide them in mid-flight. It's so cool. <laughs> that makes you feel like an uber badass when you're playing this game. <laughs> so this one, it's a little dry because a lot of these games that we showed have some kind of historical setting, right? Like obviously the Aces series right. historically set. Uh, US Navy fighters is a kind of Cold War thing. This one, there's no kind of politics to it. It's just, just blow like stuff up. Oh, okay. So it feels a little dry, yeah. um, but man, the I'm amount of cool technical stuff in this game is just amazing. Huh. Yeah. It'll take you a long time to learn how to play this game right, but it is very rewarding when you do. And is it Spectrum Holobyte as well? Uh, no, this it's in the US it was published by Spectrum oh, Holobyte, okay. but it's uh, written by Digital Integration, which I think is a British firm. Hmm. Uh, and in fact, if I remember correctly, Digital Integration, after making this game, they won a contract to build a real flight simulator for an actual fighter plane. So oh, somebody was impressed. Yeah, I yeah. could see that though. I could see the military going, okay, these guys are already doing it, working out all yeah, the bugs, right. you know. <laughs> May as well, yeah. yeah. So uh, going back to World War II, this is a microprose game, 1942, the Pacific Air War. I love these covers back that they would do. Back. Yeah. A couple of games had that sort of look to it. And That's right, another one is uh, F-14 Fleet Defender, which is another great game right, actually. Right. Huh. So this one is, uh, the content is kind of similar to um, Aces of Europe, but mm. the simulation is kind of more hardcore, right? Mm -hmm. So flying the planes is harder. Um, doing some things like attacking a ship with a torpedo is super hard. You have to be at just the right speed and just the right height, oh, otherwise okay. it fails. So. Yeah. Uh, again, it takes you quite a while to learn it, very rewarding. Also, hmm. everything texture mapped, it looks beautiful. Really? Uh, the cool thing about this is they released two versions. They released a gold version, which came on uh, CD. Hmm. Uh, and it had everything in the 90s, it came on CD, it had to have the multimedia thing, right? right? So it had the little Windows 3 multimedia <laughs> thing with the videos. But what was cool was it wasn't just kind of pointless videos. It was actually tutorials on how to play, hmm. which is very cool. Um, and the nice thing is the gold version added a bunch of content, they added additional planes and stuff, so Micropose released all that additional content for free. You can go to their BBS and download BBS. it, <laughs> and they added it all in, so that's very cool actually. Huh. That's awesome. Yeah. And then you have, at the bottom there... The final one, the other 800 pound gorilla of the yes. flight sim world is, of course, Microsoft Flight Simulator. Yeah. So this is an example of a kind of civilian, non-combat game. Uh, here, the, what they do is, it's completely open world. They basically give you chunks of the planet to fly over and some planes. And you know where you go. You've mm -hmm. got all the navigation beacons, and you fly as if you were flying a real plane. Now, when I was at your house and you were showing me some stuff, and you were showing me Seattle, were you playing this, or like a, a modern version of this? Or? Yeah. So uh, Microsoft produced up to version ten of Flight Simulator. It's okay. called X, but it's version ten. Um, that 
the cool thing about that is it covers the entire planet in high resolution detail. And so. you and I think you, the the uh, weather was real or something. The weather is actually yeah, they will download the actual weather from weather stations and render that in game. So, so it's yeah, very so cool. if you go yeah. to, to Chicago or Seattle, it, it's the current weather. It's the current weather, yeah. <laughs> so the nice thing about uh, uh, Flight Sim 10 is when Microsoft shut down the Flight Sim team, which was a huge tragedy, um, the game kind of went into you know, collapse. I mean, people had their versions, mm -hmm. but the thing is, it was such a huge community around Flight Sim. Like, people produce add-ons, but not just like you know, like people will mod games. Right. This is like you can buy add-ons that cost more than the original game, right? Like yeah. add-ons licensed by Boeing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so wow. there was such a huge uh, community rally around it that a British company called Dovetail Games actually got the rights to continue producing the game and released it through Steam. Now, now are, are you referring to around 9-11 uh, when, when the, this was a little bit controversial? Uh, yeah, around 9-11 there was a controversy. Somebody yeah. said that you know these guys had used Learned, flight sim yeah. to, to crash yeah. the planes into buildings, which is not true. They were actually trained, real trained pilots. Okay. Uh, because you, like you said, you actually shouldn't, don't climb and fly a real plane after <laughs> doing this. It's not safe. Um, so if you're interested in trying Microsoft Flight Simulator, uh, these old versions are very cool for the retro atmosphere we've talked about yeah but like if you go to steam the latest version of flight sim it's on sale all the time like 10 or 15 bucks huh. if you're just curious give it a try it's it's really great yeah that's Actually, awesome yeah So that's a little bit of an intro on that, but how do you get these games to run? Because yeah. you have games from the 80s all the way up till now. Right. If you're gonna go back and, and try to collect for the 80s and early 90s, I mean, how, do you, how do you do that? So it's um, there's a couple ways you can do mm -hmm. it. So one obvious way is if you are uh, playing games from a system like the Commodore 64, then you would go emulation, right? right. That's probably the best way. Uh, the, you can try getting real a real disc to run, but as we know, floppy disks degrade over time, so they don't yeah. always run. And actually, um, old PC game or PC computers are getting collectible now. People yeah, are buying right. up these these parts, you know, because yeah. they're, they're they've been thrown away, and so there's not that many out there. So. Yeah. So um, when it comes to PC, it's a little bit easier because there is a there is actually a PC emulator to run on PCs, which sounds weird, but <laughs> uh, it's called DOSBox, and actually yeah. it'll run on a Mac and it runs on yeah. Linux and pretty much every other format. Yeah. There's probably something for the iPhone by now. Yeah. Um, and so with DOSBox, you can actually take the files from your disk and you can use something like, I've got this um, three inch USB disk drive, right? So huh. you can buy the game, stick in your disk and it reads normally. So this shows up as a... As a this shows up as a regular USB drive on your machine. I um, need one of these, wow. Okay. Yeah, I uh, picked this up at Goodwill for like four bucks. Huh. So, yeah. Um, copy the files over and then point DOSBox to that directory where you copy the files yeah. and then you can run it. And the cool thing about DOSBox is you can set it and say, hey, I want a machine with this much memory, right. VGA, yeah. Sound Blast or not. And you know what's cool? Remember trying to get enough conventional memory oh. available? <laughs> that was my job. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, now you are a checkbox in DOSBox that oh. says maximum memory, check, and you're done. So You don't know how many times someone would be like, <laughs> they, they call up with Aces over Europe and uh, it was a CD version. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> in order to get enough conventional memory, you would have to strip out the mouse because the CD drivers the CD drive would, yeah, <laughs> would take up too much. It's like, and then, you know, uh, it, on some compact computers, they may not get sound. We might right. have to disable sound because the sound drivers were taking too much. It was a nightmare. Yeah. So I know, and actually, uh, I use DOSBox on Mac, and it's a program called Boxster, and essentially you just drag and drop. I mean, it's yeah. amazing. Super easy. Yeah, Super and, it, and, it can, yeah. and it configures the uh, you know, interrupts for yeah, the sound for drive. Sound cards, yeah. yeah, it's it's, like, it's very easy, and it'll also um, take your USB joystick and make it appear as whatever kind of stick you want, a Thrustmaster or whatever. Right. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, if you don't feel like getting into all that kind of, you know, because mm. it's it's a bit hacky. Yeah. Um, there is a site called Good Old Games, GOG.com. Yes. They they basically do this for you. When you yep. buy a package for them from them, and like you can buy a retro sim for like five bucks. Oh, and it's, they run sales all the time. Yeah, and it is it's great. They got a money back guarantee. Yeah. It's an awesome place to to buy from. You just install it, and they've set up all the DOSBox stuff for you. Double click, yeah. and away you go. It's a really cool way to play. It, it's yeah. really cool, actually. A lot of these games that you see right here, uh, I will buy the, the GOG version yeah, simply just to have it because it's right. so convenient. It's so right? convenient, yeah. And then you have all your manuals and things. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so that that's up to sort of the, the DOS era, but then we get to Windows 95, 98, and yeah. all that stuff. And how do you do that? So you can actually install Windows 95 in a DOSBox instance. So I have a DOSBox instance oh, running really? Windows 3.1. Okay, which is, it's still. Looks pretty good. 
good to me. I'm sure. Like, I'm super old now, I guess, but it still <laughs> looks pretty good. There is a kind of weird time. The games around 2000, between 2000 and 2005 are still kind of hard to get to work. Yeah. Uh, but it's possible if you uh, if it, you put a little energy into it. It yeah. was a transition period, not only for the operating system, but also for 3D accelerators. Yeah. And, when, that, and that's the problem, like the 3D effects and stuff and getting yeah. a good wrapper for all that. Sometimes games work okay, sometimes they yeah, don't. That's right. Yeah. There are glide wrappers, but they're unreliable. And in the early days of DirectX, they still don't have a good yeah. story for it now. But um, I think if you really want to get retro on flight sims, though, the sweet spot really is IBM PC from between about 1987 and 1995. <laughs> That's where the sweet spot is. So, uh, but let me ask you this, though. I mean, is it hard to go back and play those old games? I mean, do, you know, they, they look pretty dated. So I think the you you go in with the right expectations, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. anything, and then yeah. it's cool, right? <laughs> so, um, like, I will play modern games now. Like, I will play the latest version of Microsoft Flight Simulator, and it, it is very realistic, actually. Mm -hmm. But I will still play, like, Flight Sim 5 from 1992. Yeah. Um, because it's, like, you know how you you crack in an Atari 2600 cart, yep. and you appreciate it for the aesthetic, and the, it's a thing of its time. Yeah. And it's the same kind of thing, right? You look at it, and you think, man, the amount of effort and time that went into yeah. this thing, and you appreciate it kind of on that level. Yeah. And actually, while I was collecting footage for these videos, uh -huh. like I just kind of got lost <laughs> into it. It's, it's super fun. Like some of those games, the Microprose games were designed by Sid Meier, right? Like that guy's a master of game design. Yeah, that's true. The games really, the difficulty level is right there. They really suck you in. Yeah. So. Apart from being just sandboxes, there is really solid gameplay in them. Huh. They are just fun. They're oh. actually just fun, yeah. All right, dude. Well, that's a quick look at you know part of your epic flight sim collection. Yeah, I have got a lot more of these lying around at home. Some really weird, obscure stuff, too. Uh, like uh, games for the 2600. <sighs> Who uh, knew? <laughs> that's right, yeah. Uh, lots of stuff for the Commodore 64, some of which are pretty cool. Yeah. So, you know, uh, let us know in the comments. Like, if you want to see more of these games, we can bring out some more, some hardware maybe that you want to look at, controllers. Y you know, uh, you yeah. know what I want to cover? What? The Jane series. We can do. I have most of the Longbow series. Longbow is can so do the, awesome. Longbow is fantastic. I know. And we can cover the next thing that TK did after doing Longbow when he went and became an indie dev. Huh. Huh. Very cool series. I'll leave that as a mystery. <laughs> and if people want to see what he did, then we can do a video on that. Yeah. So let us know down in the comments below what you guys thought about this video. Would you like to see more? I'd love to uh, to hear from you guys. Where can people find you on the interwebs? So uh, on the interwebs, I work very hard. Go to <laughs> rabbitengineering.com to see some of the things I'm working on now. We have a Facebook page as well. Mm -hmm. um, and also I'm on YouTube, so you know, uh, leave a comment. I will be responding to the comments to this video if people want to have a discussion. Yeah. And yeah, we can, we can have some fun. Yes, and th by the way, those are those little micro 3D printed consoles and computers. That's so, right, yeah. They're so awesome. All right, man, well, thanks for coming on my channel. Thank you guys for watching this, and take care. Take care. Dave and I have done a couple videos, including one where he shows us how he makes those mini 3D printed consoles. That's one of, one of my favorites with him. It's so cool. We also did a video where Dave shows how he makes those custom tabletop arcades these are little mini arcade units made of wood with screens built in, controls, everything. Very cool stuff. So definitely check them out. Danger zone! <laughs> <laughs> that was actually in, in focus, which might be funnier if it was out. It was out of focus.